We, Hi, everyone. We, we may have to change that music. Every yeah, time... the, the, the music is very somber. So I'm Luann Morris, and I'm here with Deborah Colleen Rose, and she is recording her audio biography. Um, we're doing it in snippets. So don't be alarmed that we are skipping. We're, we're on marriages. So we're skipping marriage number two. And we're going to go right on to number three. <laughs> just moving right on. I, I'm just not ready to talk about number two. Just to, to explain a little bit. Uh, my second marriage was was deeply, deeply passionate. And it was also deeply traumatic because he died after we had only been married a year. And so I was widowed at a very early age. But there was a lot going on because we had an on and off relationship. But I'm just I'm not ready to talk about that yet. So moving right along. <laughs> moving right along. So approximately how what age were you with number three? Oh my God. Let me see if I can figure that out. Um Katie was born in 1990. So I don't know, maybe 27, 28. Okay. okay. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Again, remember head injuries, timelines are a little messed up, but um, I, I got married, I think around 18 months after I had been widowed, but I had known this person for quite a while and we had uh, been friends and we did bounty hunting together because he was a bounty hunter and you know, I often thought maybe he married me because he just wanted to help participate in my bell bond business. But, you know, I have a lot Perhaps. of theories. I have a lot of theories about that marriage <laughs> or lack of or whatever. So anyway, so he was Jewish and uh, he was six years younger than I which was uh, the beginning of me moving into younger men. Up until that point, they had been six years or more older than me, even most of the people I dated, uh, you know, but it was like the older I got, the younger my men got. <laughs> I recommend it. So, well, me too. And I think it says a lot about my, my emotional and mental state. And also now it's about my physical state. I think that's why I feel younger than a lot of people my age say they feel. So, you know. But uh, we got married. Uh, we uh, did bounty hunting together. He helped me run my my uh, bail bond business. And this is kind of an interesting little note. Uh, my second husband wanted to be in the bail bond business, and I didn't even know what it was. So I helped facilitate putting the money together so we could start that business. And then with my third husband, he wanted to be a private investigator. And I facilitated getting him licensed so we could start a PI business. When um, and I helped get him, I, I found someone that would mentor him and train him. And you know, I paid the funds to start the business, which was not a lot of money, but you know, it was a transition. So it's like when people say, "Well, you know, you have an interesting career," and I'm like, "No, not really. It's not a career. It was. It was. It was like." falling in a mud puddle. I never, I didn't grow up wanting to be a bail bondsman. I didn't grow up wanting to be a private investigator. You know, it was just life circumstances took me into those, those facilities and, mm -hmm. you know, so, um, so we were partners in uh, the bail bond business for a while and there was a lot of uh, turmoil in that. Uh, and I wound up getting out of that business um, and then we transitioned into having a PI business. And then when the marriage started going down the tubes, I went and, and worked with another PI company for a while and they went to jail <laughs> Great <laughs> for doing you know, illegal record searches and getting illegal information. And which was fine because um, the arrangement we had is I walked into their office and was trying to apply for a job. And she, the owner was a woman. And she goes, well, I'm getting ready to close the business because I don't have enough business. I'm like, wait, this is what I do. I'm a sales and, and branding and marketing person. I said, give it six months. I'll build the business up for you. And then you can make me a partner. So I did. I mean, I went in there and increased their business like by 500%. And we got on radio shows. And that's how I met my friend, Gail Lightfoot. She interviewed us on one of her radio shows and stuff like that. And, um, uh, and the business 
grew. And about the time I was going in there going, okay, it's time to make my partner. Here comes the, the, the law. Yeah. 411. <laughs> 911. <laughs> you know, and, um, I don't, you know, I don't think she served any time or anything like that. But at that point I started my own business and just transitioned and just kept growing and been doing it for over 35 years now. So why are we talking about this? I'm supposed to be talking about my marriage. Yes, um, you are. But you, you told this to say how you met him. Yeah. So anyway, the thing about it is, is that also one of the reasons why I went to apply for a job with her is because he was in and out of the marriage by the time I went and applied for this job because I did. And so I didn't know that I could count on him. I couldn't count on him as a, as a spouse. So I didn't know if I could count on him as a business partner either because he was in and out constant. And when I mean in and out, I mean, in and out, he would leave. He would just disappear. <laughs> you know? so, did, um, how long were you married? Uh, right about four years or so, you know, and, uh, what was interesting, oh God, I'd forgotten this. It's weird how this stuff just pops in my head. Cause I don't know what I'm going to say. And then it just pops in my head. We got married on Halloween Yay! and I was pregnant. Um, and, um, I, we were, went to my dad's in Texarkana and we were going to have just a little house wedding there with a few of the family members there. And I don't know, my dad knew something was up with me because I'm like, I'm going to the mall to get my hair done. Well, I wasn't going to the mall to get my hair done. I was leaving. <laughs> what? I didn't want to get married. <laughs> I was like, nope, no, nope, I'm not doing this again. And my dad followed me. And basically smart we had a shot smart man. <laughs> we had a shotgun wedding in reverse for all practical purposes. He's like, no, you're getting married. <laughs> and so he made me come home and we had our little afternoon wedding. And Josh, I guess he was like mm, three or four, maybe, maybe three or four. anyway, he had a cute little dinosaur costume for Halloween. And he stayed with my stepmom and my dad while we went and had our honeymoon night at a hotel. But um, anyway, I wound up not having that baby. Um, and But I did have a child with him later on in the marriage. So um, so anyway, it, it started out weird. <laughs> it started out weird. You had cold feet or, or do you think you knew something? Oh, I know I knew something. I mean, our very first time that we went out, it wasn't even a day, we were out... Um, running the streets looking for some bond jumpers okay and this was even before my other husband my previous husband had died we were working together doing bond jumping because um well just because we'll have to talk about that when we do that session but anyway and so I'm like okay I don't know much about you I don't know a lot about this business I was learning the business and everything because that before that I had been in the corporate world working with Honeywell and Wang computers and, you know, when uh, we first got our bail bond license, I didn't even know where the jail was. So. Okay, there you go. So that was a whole learning And that was curve. before Google. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and so we were like playing 20 questions. And my very first question right out of my mouth was, are you gay? That was my first question. So, I mean, I knew... I knew something was up with this guy. I mean, and he was not effeminate, you know, he, he wasn't overly masculine, but he was not effeminate, you know? Um, so there was no reason for me to jump right on that the way I did, but you know me, I just go to the core. Obviously of course, there was something that signaled it. Well, you know, I had great intuition all my life, great intuition, which is really kind of, um, a great example of how you can have great intuition. And if you ignore it, you will get your, your butt in a, in a crack. <laughs> and so I would know things, but I would ignore them. I, and it wasn't yes. that I was naive, but if someone told, I just, I just didn't expect people to lie to me. 
I'm, you know, I was like, I'm very loving. I'm very accepting of people. So I, it, it was always shocking to me when people felt the need to lie to me. Mm -hmm. So not really a Pollyanna. It's, it's just, what the hell? <laughs> <You know? laughs> but of course he was even worse. I mean, he, 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 he would blatantly lie to me in an effort to make me crazy. I mean, so well, I guess that is, isn't that the definition of kind of gaslighting someone? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, he, well, Richard is the king of gaslighting. He truly, 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 truly is. You could be looking at something and go, my God, that's a beautiful black. And he goes, that's not black. That's white. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and then give you a list of 20 things of why that's white and why you have gotten that totally wrong. <laughs> I'm not right. kidding. I'm not kidding. So he was good looking. He was smart. He was intelligent. He made me laugh. I'm going to tell you, a lot of men got away with a lot of shit in my life if they could make me laugh, you know? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and again, if they made me laugh and they gave me a lot of freedom to be myself, got them a lot of brownie points because I came from a very male dominated, misogynistic type family. So to be allowed to be female in my own terms was a huge benefit to a man if he wanted to be around me. If he tried to cubbyhole me uh, into a typical feminine role stereotype, then ugh, no, we're done. So. so now here you are married because your dad retrieved you. <laughs> Good old you dad. You had a honeymoon at the local hotel. Holly, Holiday Inn. Holiday Inn. And then you came back to Garland. You were living in Garland. No, we lived in um um was it Mesquite? Yeah, well, it was actually a Mesquite address. We lived in um over there in Mesquite, over there close to the East Dallas Box Springs Mesquite area. Okay. I had a and house. I had a house. Were, you ran your business from there? No. Uh I had a two offices. I had an office on Swiss Avenue and I had one on Buckner Boulevard. Okay. Yeah. So, so how did this marriage develop then? I don't remember a lot of the first years, I have to be honest. So that tells me that we were just kind of plugging along. You know, we were a little family, you know, in, from the very beginning, because I already had a son. Joshua was like three or so, I guess. And uh, we were transitioning out of the bell bond business. Uh, it took us a, a year maybe two years to do that. Cause there were law changes. Um, I'd had some um, financial difficulty with some business partners that I'd partnered with for a coalition. Um, I was heavily involved in the politics and doing lobby work, both on a state level and a national level on, you know, laws that affected the bail bond business and the industry. And um I was doing my, a lot of my own bounty hunting um, and I, I actually loved the business, but I'm not good at politics. I'm still not good at politics. I'm good at reading people, but I'm not good at modifying my behavior <laughs> to politic. Well, mm -hmm. I don't play well with others because of that. So you realize that we're talking about everything except your marriage. Well, I, cause they're all entwined. The business and the marriage are entwined because we worked together and we were married. Um, and I didn't really realize how entwined they were until this morning when I started thinking about it. I'm not trying to avoid it. I mean, I can talk about the end a lot better than I can the beginning and the middle. I don't remember a lot of, we were married. Um, we were, we worked together in the bell bond business. I got him licensed, helped him get licensed as a private investigator. Um, we actually did a lot of work with Brian Longcar, the attorney that passed here a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, a, a bunch of other criminal attorneys uh, that are have now. All the criminal attorneys I used to do bonds for now do um, uh, wrecks, car wrecks, personal injury. I, I guess because there's more money in that now than there is criminal. Probably. Um, and then we work cases together, and. I don't really recall a lot about the marriage until 
we had a case that we were working together and it was a friend of mine that got shot by her ex-husband and she was dating a Dallas County Sheriff's deputy and they both got shot and killed at my son's daycare center right there basically in front of me. And based upon the timeline and stuff, it appears that I was there and actually saw the shooting, but in my mind, I was a block away and did not actually see it. So I don't know if I actually saw it or not, but from what I have been told in the past by people in that scenario involved, involved I, I was actually across the street and witnessed it. And so he shot them and he took his daughter and kidnapped his daughter. And Richard and I actually worked together. Richard did more of the, the, the field work. I did more of the internal work on locating him and trying to retrieve the daughter and finding him because, you know, of all the things and stuff. And he got a lot of um, uh, newspaper press because of that and the attorney he was working with. And after that, I don't know, that's when things really got cattywampus in the marriage and he would just disappear. And it'd be a couple of days at a time and then it would be a week at a time. And then it'd be a couple of weeks at a time. And then he um, and I were having a discussion we were out driving around like Louisville uh, looking for some people on a case that we're working on. He goes, he goes, I really need a child of my own. And he goes, I love Joshua, but I want more children. And I'm like, well, I hadn't really considered that, you know? And uh, so we discussed that. And he goes, I really, I really need that if, you know, to feel content. So I wound up getting pregnant and uh, that's my daughter, Caitlin. And in the course of the pregnancy, that's when my memories start really getting clearer because he left in the middle of my pregnancy and just disappeared for a month. Boom. And I was having health issues and couldn't really work much. And my electricity got turned off in the interim of, of this pregnancy twice. I, I didn't have water for a week. Um, I was doing some paralegal work for an attorney and he offered me $50,000 to adopt my child. What an, you know, and he was like, well, you know, he and his wife would come over and go, you know, Richard's never coming back and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he's an asshole and blah, blah, blah. And you really need to get out of this situation, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm like, you need to get out of my house, blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the most vivid memory during the pregnancy that really kicks in there's two of them one my car got repossessed during this time because again i can't work and he's just he's gone in and out most of the pregnancy all right and so one of my old bell bond clients brought over a good time van and gave it to me so i'd have <laughs> i mean that, that well, was you a have a way to go yeah that was that was a true fuck mobile i mean it was fun though. I liked having that. And, um, and then I wound up getting a, a minivan, um, a month or so later. And I don't remember how that happened, but I did. And I'm doing surveillance. Okay. So I have started picking up surveillance clients so I can make money and I'm out to here pregnant. I'm like eight months pregnant and I'm doing surveillance and I'm real tired and I'm real hormonal and I'm about to doze off. And all of a sudden I feel this metal jab into my face and this little guy, I mean, he was a teenager is at, and this is like in October. And so Katie was born in December. So that tells you how far along in my pregnancy I was. He jabs this gun in my face and goes, give me your car. And hormones or bad juju. Or, or combination. All I did was my arm went straight up. I grabbed the gun. I twisted his arm and I punched him in his face. And I won't let go of his arm. And I continue punching him in his face going, I am six or eight months pregnant. You don't do that to a pregnant woman. Well, you don't do that to anybody, but. I was real personalized and I'm just punching him in his face and he finally gets loose and he starts running. And I'm like, Oh no, motherfucker. 
So I start the car, the van, and I'm going to run him over. I have lost my mind. I am pregnant hormone insane. This man tried to hurt my baby. I'm going to kill him. Okay. Yeah. And he's run. And this is in parts of South Dallas where they don't have curbs and they didn't have alleys that are paved. And he's running through yards and I'm driving through yards. <laughs> I'm going to catch him. And about that time, a contraction hit. And I like to have lost control of the van. And so I had to stop. I pulled over. I had to stop. And I'm and I can't get a hold of Richard. And the cramps are pretty bad and they're coming pretty fast. And uh, so I called my mother-in-law. Why I did that? Because I couldn't stand that woman and she couldn't stand me. I don't know why, but I did. And I drove myself to the local hospital and she showed up there. And it turned out to be false labor. And so then I went home <laughs> and I don't remember anything until I, I went into labor again and had Caitlin. Well, it's just odd. So did you, did he ever show up? I don't remember. This is going to be a short show, isn't it? <laughs> That's okay. But, uh, you know, I just. You called his mother. Did she not know where he was? Oh, Virginia knew everything. You know, Richard always said this, and it is true. This is so true. He says, I could kill someone and call my mother and tell her. And she goes, well, do you want me to bring one or two shovels? You know, that boy did no wrong in her eyes. Mm -hmm. She was she was a converted. She had converted to Judaism when she married uh, Richard's dad. But she was like the typical stereotype Jewish mother. You know, helicopter hovering. This is this is my glorious baby. She was also a raging alcoholic, and we all suspicions that she was also latent homosexual, lesbian. So, I mean, he 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 thought that. So, you know, and thought it for years. So, I don't remember anything between that instance and until I actually gave birth to, to Caitlin. And I remember Richard was there for the birth and then he left after Katie was born and he didn't come to the hospital for three days. I had had a C-section. So I was there two or three days. And I remember, I, I guess I was just really loving my pain pills or my pain medication because the nurse is going, going Oh, it's all right, honey, that your husband's not here. I'm sure he's busy. And I'm like, oh, he's not here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was in total la-la land. I do remember this, though. I remember that it was snowing and icy. This is right before she was born in May, uh, on December 21st. Mm -hmm. And it's snowing and icing. It's right before Christmas. And I remember looking out the window and seeing 30, because I was in, this was the Mesquite Hospital that's not there anymore. I see this lines of vehicles stuck on the highway on 30 because of the ice. And then I found out later that my dad was sitting in that traffic right in front of that hospital for two hours. He had come in from Texarkana to deliver a car to a car dealership for a friend of his and sat there, knew, knew I was in the hospital, knew where it was and he sat there in traffic for two hours and did not stop and come in to see me or his new grandchild. I was livid. Absolutely livid. What? What does that face mean? There's no excuse for that. I'm telling you, people are mean to me. People have no idea how mean people are to me. It is a wonder that I am as sweet as I am. <laughs> okay <laughs> it's a wonder that so, i tolerate humanity as all i can say is if he if he uh, well so he showed up next twin did he take you home no my mom and stepdad were here watching josh while i was in the hospital and they picked me up and brought me home from the hospital on christmas eve it was the day before Christmas, and he came home late that night, so he'd be here for Christmas. Now, this is where it gets good. Wait. 
Okay. So let me, let me keep going. So mm -hmm. about a week later, we drove the kids over to his mother's house. Why? I don't know. Cause it was always a pig stun. It was always stank and it was, and she smoked and it was, uh, but he insisted we go over there. And I, I often wonder if he did that because he knew I would see what I saw. And there was a hospital bill from another hospital sitting on her coffee table. And I said, Richard, why is the hospital sending our bills here? And I picked it up and I looked at it and it was for a man that I knew that he knew that they were friends and it was for treatment of um, genital warts. I forget the, the name that you call genital warts, but um, for that virus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why is his bill coming here to you and your name? Why? And he never would answer me. So, so I just put the bill in my purse and I kept it. Well, when I went in a month later for my after birth checkup, they did a pap smear and it came back as uh, stage two cervical cancer. Papillonia virus, that's what it's called. And um, the doctor said that it was caused by that. And I showed, I said, well, could this have anything to do with it? And I pulled that bill out of my purse and he looked at it. And he looked at Richard and he goes, you gave your wife cancer. That's exactly what he said. And Richard just got up and walked out. So, you know, I had been having my suspicions all during the marriage that when he was gone and stuff that he was having affairs. And I suspicioned it was with men, but I never had anything that I could put my finger on at that point. Mm -hmm. So that was my first physical indication that he was so the, you know the only question was, was was it really his lover that had the virus that he went with and treated or was it him using his lover's name so it wouldn't be on the records but regardless I wound up having a hysterectomy two months after my daughter was born because I didn't want to go through the laser treatments and all that I'm like no I'm done I don't want any more kids just take it out so <sighs> I'm tired <laughs> I would have been angry. Oh, I was furious. I, I I lived in rage for three and a half years. It was one. I, I had one of the most difficult pregnancies with my daughter because I was enraged for nine months. Nine entire months. I was just enraged. So. We went to San Antonio um, uh, the weekend before I was supposed to have my surgery to just kind of get away. And, you know, my intention was to say, you know, what the hell are we doing? You know, something's got to be done here. And the only thing I remember about that trip was we went to this really nice uh, restaurant in San Antonio and um, Kathleen, what is her name? One of the actresses, her name is Kathleen something or another. She was in uh, uh, Body Heat. And she was there and Richard was all a gaga over her and, you know, and he had wanted to name Scarlett, I mean, uh, Caitlin, Kathleen and Caitlin was my compromise because I didn't like the name Kathleen. So, you know, he says, well, that tells me that we should, you know, keep the marriage going. I'm like, that has nothing to do with our marriage. <laughs> you seeing your favorite movie star does not give me any indication of that. <laughs> so we came to an agreement that we would stay married for a year. And he was making really good money at that point in the PI business. And he would pay all the bills and I would get to stay home with Caitlin for a year and take care of her and be a stay at home mom. Cause I'd never had that opportunity with Josh. And I wanted that. I wanted to be able to do that with Caitlin. So a year rolls around, things are rocking and rolling. And, you know, I, I guess I do have a passive aggressive bone in my body because I was watching QVC and all those TV shopping channels back then. And I would order shit and have him sit to his office. So he'd have to bring them home. So he'd know how much money I've spent. <laughs> so here we go. A year's up. It's January, a year later. And I'm waiting for him to say, well, what do you want to do? And he goes, well, he goes, things are okay. I mean, we, it was a peaceful year. We weren't fighting. He wasn't disappearing. He was paying the bills. Um, you know, I wouldn't say it was a great relationship, but it wasn't bad. I'd had some bad relationship. All right. And, uh, and I was enjoying my time with Caitlin. So I wasn't going to rock the boat. And, uh, 
So nothing said, May 21st hits, my birthday, you know, it's five months past the deadline of what we said we were going to do. And boom, papers on the door. Here you are, served, divorce. Served me with divorce papers on my birthday. What a great guy. And he wound up leaving that day and going to Florida. He had a new boyfriend in Florida. Okay. So there you have it. Now, fast forward, this this is the time period when I go and work for another company. You know, I don't know how I'm going to, and I'm with them. Uh, he has a boyfriend in Florida. He has one here. I'm telling everybody that he's fucked me over because he's gay. He sues me for slander and libel because <laughs> I tell everybody he's gay and he's going, I'm not gay, you know, because that was the you kiss of death. A boyfriend. No, really? they weren't living with them. They weren't living with them, uh. you know. They were just sneaking around. He, and he was actually dating the daughter of our best friend at that time. She was the new beard. <laughs> okay. So anyway, his boyfriend here was just a hustler, so to speak. You know, he was just out for whatever he could get. And I think he would just screw whatever was convenient if he thought there was money involved. And I kept trying to point that out to Richard. Well, I don't know. I don't know why I cared. But just to prove a point, I stole his boyfriend away from him. I made better promises to him. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know why. That's but that ironic. It was, wasn't it? <laughs> so once I broke up that relationship, he packed up everything and he moved to Florida. And in our final divorce to papers, it even says that I forced him to move to Florida because he was afraid of me. <laughs> I would have said, what about the fact that you wanted to have a child? I got pregnant and you disappeared the whole time. Oh, we had that discussion. I mean, we, I, you know me. I analyzed it from A to Z to infinity, okay? And we discussed it. And he, Richard was a great conversationalist. He was super, super intelligent. And he had an explanation for everything. But, you know, he would do things to drive me crazy. Like he would leave and then he'd have little presents delivered to me with little coded messages like he i remember he sent me a, a rod stewart cd with one of the songs circled and it was about uh you know how much he missed his wife and his baby son in the song i can hear the song but i can't think of the name and everything and i'm and i'm listening to this going and, and, and it's saying in the song i'll be home soon i'm like so what the hell just come home if you're coming home you know what the hell does this mean yeah <laughs> You know, and he'd, he'd always have these coded, cryptid messages and everything he did. It, it, it made, made no sense. It really didn't. And, that you know, I just, crazy. it did make me crazy. I think, I think that was part of his goal in life. I think he wanted to get me committed. And uh, I think he thought I had more money than I did. And I think he wanted to get me committed so he could get his hands on my money because I didn't give him access to all my money. So. Well, um, you know, I think that's one of the uh, markers of a um, gaslighter. You know, I they want it's... you to they want you to think you're crazy. They want other people to see you doing crazy things. So when they decide that they want to officially make you crazy, everybody's on board. Oh yeah. Well, I, I just think that's evil. I, I had um, a huge gay um, clientele with the Belmont business and um, two of the guys that worked for me were gay and they also did design work on my house and repairs and stuff. And Danny was just, he was incredible. Um, I just loved him to death. And he just go, girl, you know, he is as gay. The swish, swish, swish. Watch that walk. <laughs> and um Richard came in my office one day and was demanding that I give him some money or something. And Danny just got his face. He goes, let me tell you something. He goes, I may be gay, but I love that woman more than you do. And he goes, I'll be damned if I'm going to let you take anything from her today while I'm here. And he knocked him on his ass. <laughs> Good for him. 
And I just looked at Danny. I said, how come you love me so much and my own husband treats me like shit? He goes, because he's just evil. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> I think that pretty well sums it up. Unfortunately, that would sum it up. He yeah. is uh, greedy. They want what they want. Well, it's really interesting because his dad was super, super wealthy. His, I always, I always regretted the fact that I didn't know his dad better because I, I always thought he would have a, be a fascinating person to know. His dad was um, from Hungary, oh. and he lived in Hungary during World War II when Hitler took over. Oh wow! And came to this country when he was fifteen. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is a true story or not, but I just thought, man, this is ingenious if it is. Um, he was, I think there was just him and one other family member that made it out alive and the rest of the family died in the camps. Mm -hmm. And the story that I was told was that the way he made it here was he was going through a, a Nazi uh, military check and they were questioning him on whether or not he was... Uh, not Jewish. It was the opposite of not being Jewish. They was, you know, just white, I guess. Christian? Or whatever, yeah. And so, you know, Jewish people are circumcised, but it was not common for people in Germany and that part of Europe, just if they were Christian, to be circumcised. That was not a common practice back then. And he says, yes, you want to see my dick? I'll show you. <laughs> And of course, if they had said, yeah, show us, he'd been in a mess. So, but that's supposedly what got him through the lines. So he made it to America. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, it was a devout Democrat and lived cr across the alley from uh, President Bush when he moved over here to Dallas. Wow. And used to go to all his Fourth of July parties, which I just thought was hilarious. <laughs> wow. So, um, Richard's mom and dad were divorced, huh? Yeah, they divorced when he was, uh, I guess, not quite in his teens. And he had a younger brother named Stephen. And, um, what happened to him? Well, he's dead now. He okay. uh, was an alcoholic and an addict and wound up dying an early death a couple years ago. That's sad. I know a lot of people that are dead. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. So Virginia's gone. Gabriel, his dad is gone. Richard's still alive as far as I know. No one's said anything about him not being alive. But I get calls all the time for bill collectors for him. I'm like, I don't know this man. Still? <laughs> yeah. After all these well, years? Yeah. Yeah. His dad disinherited him. He didn't get any money when his dad died. Oh, boy. I bet that so, was something. Well, you know, I don't, I don't believe in karma in the traditional meaning, but when people say karma is that you reap what you sow, well, he's getting karma. He's reaping what he sowed, you know, so. What are you, what are you thinking? Well, I, he, you said that his brother was a drug addict. And, and an alcoholic. alcoholic, so he kind of followed in mom's footsteps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm surprised that Richard didn't. Well, I think that he went in a different direction. He just went into ha having no character. <laughs> and so, you know, um, Gabriel was very wealthy in the way he made his fortune, from what I was told. I don't know if any of this is true. I have nothing to prove it, but it's what. I was told by the family is that he had a TV repair shop over there off of Fitzhugh in that little section over there where there's that shopping center, you know, the little strip center and stuff. Um, used to be the pharmacy and the, the sweet shop and all that. And people would bring their TVs in for repair. And he says, oh, well, this can't be repaired. You just need to buy a new one and would sell them a new TV. And then he'd keep the old TV and then he'd repair it and sell it, <laughs> you know? So, and then he bought a lot of um, uh, low-income homes, you know, and had uh, rental property and stuff. And um, he, so he lived very well and um, invested well. And, you know, Virginia lived, you know, on not poverty level because she had a good job until she retired. But 
She didn't have much of anything. Her furniture was ratty. I, I don't know why she lived the way she did, because she she could afford better, but she didn't. So. Yeah, that is odd. You would think so, that, she, that with a successful husband or ex-husband that she would have been used to that, living better. Yeah, you know. But, you know, her <laughs> drinking was a problem even when the boys were little because Richard would tell me stories about, you know, he played soccer and he'd be at the soccer field waiting to get for someone to pick him up and he'd be there two, three hours till like nine o'clock at night. Damn. Waiting for her, you know, and, you know, for her to pick him up because she was drunk and forgot to come get him and things like that. And I know for a fact that, um, you know, he there was court order visitation for him to see Caitlin and uh, Josh would go with her because by that time he was old enough to see what was going on and he could call me if something was wrong and there and Richard would take them over to Virginia's and just leave them and he would call me saying there's no food in the house and we're just sitting here eating Cheerios and I'd have to go get them you know but if I didn't comply and at least make them available then I would have been in, in a violation mm-hmm the court and then i would have been fined or you know found in contempt could have even been jailed so this at least child that he wanted so desperately he didn't even spend time with mm -mm. no and he never came to see her and he wound up giving his parental rights signing his parental rights over to me so that uh scott my husband could adopt them wow. so you know and uh when he signed he, this here's what's really interesting when he sued me for libel, he represented him himself in court. This tells you how smart he was. I had two attorneys. I had a, my divorce attorney and I had a civil attorney and he won the libel law lawsuit. He won it. He won the libel lawsuit and got a judgment for $1 million against me. Now I got him to... Uh, negate that judgment in exchange for me agreeing to not make him pay his back child support because when he gave up his parental rights he owed two hundred fifty thousand dollars in back child support which i never see a penny of so there was no point in it even talking about it even if he'd have had it no no he wasn't going to do that. He he could have always sent money for, for Caitlin, even for presents or whatever. He never sent her a gift. He never sent her a card. He didn't even see her after um, the divorce. And well, he saw her once. I take that back. He saw her once until and he didn't see her again until she was 18 years old. And then all he wanted to do was try to get a hold of her money. And when he couldn't control her money, he sent her home. Now that's what she told me. What does me. she think about that experience? She's she's very unhappy. She's like me. She's very unhappy that she can look past the inadequacies of her parent, and yet they still fail to to try to maintain a relationship. And I, I'm a, that kind of sums up how I am with my dad too. I think I've just gone off into a rabbit hole trying to do this. Well, um, well of course, my own sanity. <laughs> uh, what I see from this relationship is you spent more time by yourself than you did with him. I did. I did. It, you know, he talked to you about having a child and you went there and. I did. I went there. Then he didn't even take care of that. So I don't know. It just, it's, it's interesting to me and it's, it's made me do a, a lot of reflection on why I'm so tolerant on so many levels, but there are certain things that I just cannot abide by, you know? And I, I, you know, I seem to have a real short fuse on things that a lot of people will just let slide off their back, but I'm willing to give grace to people 
on like major issues. <laughs> okay, but one of the things that you did tell me is that even though he was gay and had a gay relationship, that you really tried to work out the marriage. I did. I was willing accommodate. to accommodate. I was willing to have um, a semi-open marriage. Um, it, with but there had to be you know there had to be rules you know and and the rules were all based on honesty. And it became very apparent that honesty was just nowhere in Richard's character, mm -hmm. nowhere. Um, and whether that was learned because that's what he had to do to protect himself or what, I don't know. But, I, you know, I'm a very open minded person. And as long as I can stick to my own ethics for my own behavior and my own morals for my own behavior, I can allow a lot of flexibility especially if I see, because I'm able to see the bigger picture and and see my part in it instead of the big picture being me. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds so woo woo woo, but you know, it's just that, you know, I had two small children and we had a fairly successful business and I really loved him and I enjoyed his company when he was around. <laughs> and so I could live in a, a marriage where sex was not part of the foundation mm -hmm. as long as I knew I was as important to him as he was to me. Mm -hmm. And there were ways that he could show me that, but he wasn't willing to do that either. Yeah. You know, because at the, up until that point, I had thought, well, all of this behavior leading up to this was because he couldn't get comfortable with who he was. He was living in denial. He had been lying to himself. I mean, this is still this is still the the nineties. I mean, it's not like everybody's going, yeah. "Oh, you're going to embrace you," you know? Yeah, yeah, that didn't and, happen then. Well, and we had just come out of the 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 climactic part of the HIV mm -hmm. tragedy. You know, I mean, I had thirty two friends that died in one year from HIV. And I mean, and that was not too far over our shoulder behind us yet. So, I mean, there was a lot of stigma with homosexuality and all that other stuff. Right. Um, and uh, while he was so busy trying to hide who he was, at the same time, I was able to be free to be who I was. So there was such a huge imbalance in the relationship because I was trying to pigeonhole what was acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable behavior. And I'm not saying I was wrong. Don't get me, okay? I, my expectations th were legitimate and they were understandable. But he never gave me any requirements or any expectations or any restrictions. So... This is indicative of someone chasing after another person. And that never works. No. That never works. So, you know, but when you're in the middle of that and you're hormonal and you're. And it doesn't matter uh, when you love someone. Yeah. You, you know, you're married. You want to show it to them. You want, that's why you chase. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of people say, well, you just, you know, did you stay in the marriage because you were ashamed to admit that you had made a mistake? And I'm like, no, people already knew I'd made a mistake. They knew the chaos I was living with. They knew the drama and the heartbreak I was living with. Uh, I was the underdog in this situation and people felt sorry for me. So, you know, regardless of whether I stayed in the marriage or whether I got out of the marriage, there was no way to make me look like a hero or anything of that standard. And, and, and unless they knew deep of who I was, I was always going to be a victim to the public in this scenario. Mm -hmm. Now I hated that. I hated that because I wasn't a victim. Everything I did was uh, with an awareness of where I was on the chessboard and how many pawns I had already lost. And, and the only thing I had left was the queen and she could only move one step at a time, you know? So um, it was humiliating, not because he was gay, not because he, it, it was because people saw me as a victim and I didn't feel like I was a victim. I felt like I had a bad situation and I needed to figure out what was best for me, for the children, 
for mm-hmm. the family, for him, because I didn't want him to be unhappy either. Well, not when you love someone, you don't want them to be unhappy. No, now, you know, so you can go, okay, but Deborah, you stole this boyfriend. Well, he didn't, that boy did not love him, number one. <laughs> number two, I knew he was just taking advantage of Richard. And number three, I was an angry woman at that point. You know, I had to do something to feel like I had some say so in my life because I felt stripped of all dignity and all power at that point. Did it make me feel better? No, it really didn't. It was great sex, though. So, (laughs) So, um, did this defamation thing come before the divorce or after? After. Okay. After. It was kind of like on the heels of it. They kind of like just went, flowed and wanted to do it. To the best of my memory, okay? So... Yeah, because you've already said you don't remember the first two, first year. <laughs> well, I think they kind of flowed together. I think, you know, they were just kind of hand in hand during the same time period, you know, but the divorce came. And I, you know what? And he, this, this is hilarious now that I think about it. So I have money, but I can't touch it because it's tied up in the bond business to where I can't touch it. Okay. And there's a whole big explanation. And it's not worth explaining. Just know I can't touch it at this point. And, um, it's like having a lien on a house. All right. Mm -hmm. And so I am having to move out of the house that I had bought before we were even married because I'm having to downsize and I'm moving closer to friends so they can help me with the kids and stuff like that. So I am selling everything out of this house. I'm selling the copper pipe. I'm selling the, the appliances, the carpet was new and one of my friends that was a contractor came and pulled the carpet out and sold it for me. And for, oh, that's another thing. Richard's birthday is on Valentine's. We never celebrated Valentine's because that was his birthday. We couldn't do it before, the day before. Couldn't do it the day after. It just didn't exist because his birthday existed. So he ruined Halloween for me. He ruined Valentine's for me. I hated Thanksgiving anyway. So it pretty much just leaves Easter and Christmas for me anyway. <laughs> but so, so I'm sold so, everything. I had bought him this beautiful chandelier. Richard's so bougie, it's unbelievable. He loved anything that denoted uh wealth or anything like that. He was a brand whore, you know, it, it, that type of thing. Just real bougie, bougie. So we lived in a modest home, but um I bought him this beautiful crystal chandelier. I sold that chandelier. I sold all of my expensive artwork because I was an art collector. All I heard for, I don't know how long, the, the whole time that we continued talking before, during, and after our divorce, all I heard was what a bitch I was because I sold his chandelier. <laughs> <laughs> I have never been so sick of hearing about something in my life. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> okay. So well, that does that tell you uh, the big word of the day, materialistic? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much, pretty much. So there you have it. There you have it. And so so now you're trying to pick your pieces up and did you rent for you and the kids? Yeah, I rented a home for a while. And then during that time period, I dated again, had a lot of fun. And ironically, one of the people I really enjoyed dating was another gay guy. Gay men are fun. They're just, they're great dates. You know, there was not a love relationship. We were not getting married, but we just, we hung out and had a good time together. It was fun you know and then I did meet another man uh and wound up getting engaged and getting married I guess maybe 18 months 18 months seems to be like my time frame 18 months after the divorce or something like that and um he wound up seriously he's the only husband I'm embarrassed about (laughs) really yeah 
um, because he was a liar, he was an adulterer, he was a cheat, and he had schizoaffective disorder. <laughs> and what pissed me off about him was that he dated women by telling them stories about that were my stories, like he had lived them. He was well, that sounds like a great place to stop because next time we're going to talk about husband number four. I want to talk about my dating. Dating was much more fun. We need to get well, to my you dating. You can do that. This is the dating between three and four, right? Uh, when I'm the dating after one, and between one and two, and the dating after three, between three and four. Yeah. So anyway, we can do that. So I'm done. <laughs> So you have some good stories about your dating. I enjoyed dating. Dating's fun. I I always laugh at uh, people that talk about and complain about dating. I always thought it was fun. I had a good time. I always met interesting people and I dated a wide spectrum of people. So I never got bored. I guess not. <laughs> All right. Well, tell everybody goodbye. <laughs> yes. Uh, this audio biography will be continuing. Uh, we're only up to about age, what, 33? Yeah, but we have so much stuff that we have to go back and cover. We're just focused on marriages right now. And those are right. really, except for my marriage to Scott, the others are just little snippets. I mean, they're like commercials between the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Okay, stay uh, tuned for the next episode of um, I'm no angel, but I have met the devil. Yep. Yep. And he looks like you. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. All right, Bye. Deborah. Fun Bye. as usual. Thanks. Bye. Bye.